Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing today, or as we are doing right now, and you can then watch the recording of the show um, at your convenience. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, uh, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Uh, for those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries. We're similar to your state library. And we provide, ser provide services to all types of libraries in the state. So you will find um, shows on Encompass Live uh, for all types, uh, public, academic, K-12, corrections, museums, archives, anything and everything. Really, our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries. Book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, demos of services and products. Um, we, um, we have a Nebraska Library Commission staff that do sessions for us sometimes. And we have guest speakers that we bring in from across Nebraska and across the country sometimes. And today we have a mixture of that. <laughs> today we are doing our annual um, best new children's books of 2021 and 2022, I see you've added, <laughs> looking to ahead. Um, Sally Snyder is our coordinator of children and young adult library services here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Good morning, Sally. And Dana Fontaine is a librarian at our Fremont High School in Fremont, Nebraska. And they are going to tell us about all the great new books that they have been reading over the past year. And Dana, yes. I think you're up first. I fell down a rabbit hole, and so that's why I added yeah. the 2022. 2022 books because there's so many amazing ones coming out. I'm super excited about this. All right, the first one that I'm going to talk about is the 1619 Project. It's also an adult book, but they have a ch children's book form. Illustrations are beautiful. Um, when studying her family tree, the author can only find three generations of information. Her grandma gathers everyone together and they chronicle 400 years of information. From Africa to the United States, they tell about ancestors that were born on the ship to the United States. And actually, they told how they were taken, how um, her ancestors were doctors and really important people in the African community and country in their home country and when they were brought here they were treated like less than people and so it was really interesting and it was very well done and speaks to children room for everyone um, will I ever get to the beach? This young boy is impatiently waiting as the Dala Dala drives to the beach, stopping every few minutes to pick somebody else up. In the end, he realizes that it was the kind thing to do, and he wishes, like, if he were in that situation, he would also wish that somebody would do that for him. This is one of my favorites. So look at the title, Shea Bob by Bob Shea. Uh -huh. <laughs> Isn't that funny? That's my favorite. <laughs> I don't know if we can beat that. <laughs> so Bob, Bob is an alligator. And this book is probably one of my favorites too. Of course, these are all my favorites. So <laughs> stop saying that. Wow, this seems like an awesome restaurant. It is a different one. It is located on Alligator Bob's nose. Bob gets super excited when birds from all over the world settle down and don't leave. He will always have food. But will Bob do the right thing and allow his dinner guests to leave without becoming dinner? <laughs> and I'm really excited, How to Catch a Gingerbread Man by Adam Wallace and Andy Elgerton. My students love these books. Like whenever I pull a new one out, they're just like, yes, and they, and they kind of freak out a little bit. So um, this is the newest one and it's funny and it's rhyming and it's a story time favorite. There's, this one's a little different though because the gingerbread man comes and wreaks havoc 
among everything. So what happens when the story you're reading comes to life? Pretty soon, all the stories come to life in the library. Who's to blame? The gingerbread man. He's so mischievous in this fantastical rhyming story. The gingerbread man wreaks so much havoc in his school. All right. Um, and then the next one is, I don't want to read this book by Max Greenfield. And he played Schmidt on New Girl. Yeah, and, and this book is so funny and it's interactive and um, it's along the same lines as the book with no pictures, but there's a lot of books coming out that target reluctant readers. And that's amazing because surprise, surprise, not everybody likes to read first at first. So <laughs> I know I was shocked too. When I found out, I didn't believe it, but um, he writes to reluctant readers and it's funny and interactive and it's just a really good book. This one's funny too, Animals Go Vroom by Abby Cushman. So many things are happening in the background in this book. What is making all of those sounds? A sneak family is just simply going on a trip and, the chaos ensue, and then chaos ensues. This is great for teaching onomatopoeia and inferences, and it's so funny as well. And there's just so much going on like, on one of the pages, it's just blank and it says the taxi goes beep or something is beeping and you turn the page and it's just chaos on that page. <laughs> and it's so funny. Another reluctant reader run, James, James's Reading Rescue. Show, um, this showcasing a story about students who have difficulty reading and this book stars James, a student who has trouble reading. He has so much trouble reading that he has to stay in from recess to practice, which is, you know, devastating to students. So when he finds the right audience, a white rescue cat, his view on reading changes. And it's kind of, it's a heartwarming story. So it has to do with rescue animals and reading. Favorite book ever. <laughs> Perfectly Pegasus by Jesse Sima. And this is the companion to Not Quite Narwhal. In fact, Narwhal makes an appearance in here. Um, Pegasus has an awesome life. She lives among the stars and the clouds and she talks to the stars. She should be happy, but she is lonely. Where can Pegasus make friends? When she makes a wish, she starts to meet friends that are like her. She just needs to look in other places. Big Wig by Jonathan Hillman. This is a little bit controversial, but it's perfect for drag story time. If you have drag story time in your library, um, this is the best book to have. So when a neighborhood boy dresses in drag to compete in a neighborhood competition, he dons a wig and becomes BB Dazzle. His wig, named Wig, however, Wig feels small compared to the other fancier, bigger wigs. What will he do to have confidence again? And the wig kind of takes on a mind of its own. <laughs> and it's about being yourself. Only in America, the weird and wonderful 50 states. I love quirky facts about the United States. And this is great for research. It has beautiful illustrations. Um, I, 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 okay, so the ELL, students in my school do a research projects uh, project on the 50 states and they choose a state and this book is perfect for that because it has a whole spread of the states like quirky laws um everything weird laws characteristics quirky facts and illustrations make up this wonderful book on the united states states and it's great for research and state studies I Am Courage by Susan Verde, and it's illustrated by Peter, Peter H. Reynolds, which, which he's amazing, of course. Um, this is a companion to I Am Human and I Am Loved, and it teaches resilience, resilience. And my favorite part about this is it's not preachy. So it says, you can do this for all those people that say, no, I can't. So who do you picture when you picture someone brave? What does being brave actually mean? In this book, Susan Verde and Peter Reynolds team up to change the mindset of people who say they can't. And this is great for all ages. So if you read this to your teachers, it would be a great thing to start off the school year. Um, it would be a great way to end the school year. Like it's just a really good book for all ages. And then this one is super funny, Egosaurus 
by Jennifer Wah. It's so funny. So all Max wanted was one fat dinosaur. However, a mix up at the factory results in Max getting more eggs than he bargained for. As he receives his his dinosaur egg and his dad goes, you need to send that back right now. And so the company said, oh, I'm so sorry. You're not pleased with your, with your dinosaur egg. You need, and so here's three more. Here's, here's three more that you can hatch. So not only does he have one dinosaur egg, he has three more. So he has four dinosaur eggs. So, and also there's no refunds. And so you can't really send back your dinosaur eggs, I guess. <laughs> So the problem with pajamas, oh, pajamas are the worst sometimes. They make you feel sweaty and scritchy and scratch you. Dad just might have a solution though. It, this book reminds me a lot of On Account of the Gum by Drew Daywalt, or was it? Whichever one. So, and it kind of turns into a musical. It, <laughs> the, the character in this book sings an ode to why pajamas are the worst. So, so dramatic. <laughs> Eyes That Speak to the Stars by Joanna Ho. And this is kind of along the same lines of Eyes That Kiss in the Corners, except for from a male perspective. Um, it's a similar theme. And the young boy in the story learns to be proud of his eyes and heritage and not be envious of others' different eyes. All right. Who are your people? This is this book is about found family. It made me it made me cry a lot because sometimes your family isn't the people that you're related to. Sometimes it's your friends, sometimes it's your neighbors, sometimes it's people who take you in, sometimes it's a foster family. Um, it's diverse, it's uplifting, and the illustrations are amazing. And so this this was one to definitely add to your library because you know the nuclear family is hardly a thing anymore and so you know we need to celebrate the people who have found their families and made their families their own a spoonful of faith so having mother-daughter time this duo talks about faith and their relationship with god and they also learn to have joy and it's very heartwarming it reminds me of tear soup um it's listed under christian fiction but it doesn't have like it's not preachy. It doesn't have like tons of religious overtones, but it does talk about like faith and God and love and being kind to your name. You are here. Um, not all who wander are lost. Sometimes they just like to wander. Um, this reminds me of I wish you more. You can go wherever you want and be whatever you want. You just need to know how to get there and have a have a clear path. Um, this kind of inspires you to start things. Sometimes starting is like half the battle. And um, it's very diverse and has great illustrations. I'm I'm a sucker for good illustrations. Like I love, that's why I love picture books so much because I'm like, a lot of the stories told through those illustrations. And you can see this when there's so many things going on too, right there, just on that cover. Oh yes, there's so many things. And every time, like I reread this several times and you find something new every time. Like you, in a lot of these books, you you read it once and you're like, oh, that was cute. And then you read it again and you're like, oh, I didn't notice this next time. And then it's, I love books that like, it's basically new every time you read it. And I love that. A is for B. This is one of my favorites too. Um, Each letter of the alphabet, <laughs> I know, I say that all the time. All right. There are so many languages that make up this wonderful world we live in. A doesn't always stand for something A. It stands for B as well. So A goes through, or it goes through the entire alphabet and it assigns, um, it assigns an animal or an object to each letter. But there's translations in all sorts of different languages. It is the best. I love this book. Abigail Fig, the secret agent pig. Abigail Fig, the secret agent pig, asks so many questions. All she wants to do is be a detective, though. Her family doesn't believe in her because they say she's just a pig. You're a swine. You don't need to work. But 
Abigail wants to be a detective. So read to see if Abigail actually follows her dream to become a detective. And she's thinking, why can't girl pigs be detectives? The Ghost Went Floating by Kim Norman and Jay Fleck. And this one was actually published in 2020, but I had to, like, I had to include it because this, it's, it's has like 50 million things going on. So not only is it a counting book, but it's a Halloween-ish book. It is, it goes with a song. Um, it's, you know, the ants went marching one by one, hurrah, hurrah. And instead of hoorah, they say boorah. And Aww. so... Yes, it is super, it is super cute when you're reading it and you can sing with your story time people and it's very interactive and you can get up and dance. It's great. And then special mention, Black Baller Ballerinas by Misty Copeland and it's illustrated by Selma Barnes. This is very meaningful. Every page is a different Black Ballerina. So Misty Copeland really goes through and she lists ballerinas that inspired her, ballerinas that were trailblazers. Um, it's great for research. And this is borderline. This book is kind of a little bit older than grade school, but you can, like for your advanced readers, I think it would be okay, but it's one of my favorites. So, and I love Misty Copeland and she does every single ballerina in this book justice. She celebrates everything about them. And she's a really good writer. So she's a ballerina and a writer. Also, I wanted to showcase just this one. I skipped the slide because it's coming out a little, like it's coming out later, I think. But um, Anna Duvney, I know she died in 2016, but they kind of, I don't know if she took posthumous script or writings or whatever, but Judy Schachner, who wrote Skipping John Jones and Anna Dudney pair up, and it's an all-star all -star collaboration, um, emphasizes resilience and managing disappointment and kind of showcases there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And so, Watch out for this book. I'm not sure like exactly when it will be pub published, but Anna Dudney is obviously not with us anymore. And so it's pretty sad, but Judy Schachner will probably do it justice. All right, and that's it for me. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Anybody have any questions about any of Dana's titles or any books that you want to suggest that you um, read this past year or be coming in um, 2022, that's okay as well. <laughs> Go ahead and type into your question section if you do have anything or you want to ask about any of the titles, have any clarification about anything, any more information. Um, I, I have to say I do, uh, I take a personal interest in when Sally and Dana do this um, session. Um, because I use this as a great resource for my um, holiday shopping for the my multiple nieces and nephews that I have in the family. So I'm taking notes about this. I know someone who'd like that one. <laughs> Books are the best gift ever. I have five nieces and nephews now, all like 12 and under. So I am looking for a whole range. <laughs> well, I just have a comment, Dana. I noticed that these titles are very different from the ones you had at conference. Mm -hmm. Like completely different and yeah. mine aren't. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Well, I can include both presentations too. Like whenever I share all this out, I can include both of them. Oh, that'd be great. Yes. Yeah, and I'll explain to people that are wondering about that. Yeah, this is something that Dana and Sally, as I said, this is I said this is our annual children's best children's books 2021. Um, this is a session that they always do every year at our um, annual state, um, Nebraska Library State Association State Conference, which was in October, right? Yeah. And then after that's done, we do it on here on Encompass Live so that people can see, um, hear about it as well. And oh. I did, I guess I did fall down a rabbit hole. I was like, oh, I'm going to include that one. Oh, yeah, that one too. And so I just, okay. I, you know, went on that path and Okay, the more books, the better, if you ask me. Yeah. And um, also, 
while we're talking about that too, Sally also does a uh, companion session, I suppose, of teen titles, the best new teen books of 2021. Um, so for the older um, children, kids, if that's, um, you know, if you are the, you know, the children's young adult librarian or you handle do both of those, uh, she'll be doing that session on January 5th. So um, if you're looking for books for older children, um, definitely sign up and join us for that. Sally is the need of that. Hmm? All right, Sally, I'm going to, you have your, you have slides as well, Sally? I'm ready to go. All right, I'm going to make you presenter now. Okay. So you can see the pop up to show your screen. There we go. Go ahead and start your slideshow to get them full screen. Oops. This back over here. Okay, well, we called our session at NLA Super uh, Librarian. Um, we're still looking at just the presentation. Um, oh, not my screen? Okay, I'm trying again. And I think you might need to. Do you have your, you have, you have multiple monitors? Yes. Right, go yes. up into show screen and then there we go. There they are, the full screen slides. Perfect. Okay, Great. sorry about that. I do that every time. You think I'd learn. We'll see what I do on January 5th. <laughs> Maybe I'll have learned. I have a cold. I just am finishing up a cough drop, so hopefully we'll get through this without a batch of coughing. But if it happens, I'm sorry. That's how it is. But um, these are uh, nonfiction and fiction titles for what I call upper elementary or the older kids in elementary school. And we'll start with, as soon as I get this working, whoops. Nonfiction for grades two to five or so. This is a full color graphic novel memoir. The cataloging record Shoshana looked at puts it in nonfiction, just in case you were wondering. There's lots of humor as Hootie, he's Mexican and Jewish, gains an imaginary friend slash mascot named Chunky and then tries different middle school sports. He's supposed to lose some weight and his parents suggested he try a sport. That's really not his thing, but he tries baseball, then soccer, then swimming, and tennis, and football, and finally theater. Theater is his thing. Each chapter covers a different sport and how it went for him, generally not well. And each chapter wraps up with a two-page spread called Post Game Wrap-Up, where Hootie and Chunky crit critique his experiences. So it's like the guys after the football game who sit there and talk about. So it's, it's hilarious and um, he's poking fun at himself, but also uh, in a, in a non-painful uh, way, if that I can say it that way. Mary Golda Ross was born in 1908 and her love and understanding of math propelled her to become the first woman engineer for Lockheed in 1950. Mary made many contributions to our nation's efforts to land on the moon. She strove to follow the four Cherokee values taught to her by her family and nation. They are gaining skills in all areas of life, working cooperatively with others, remaining humble when others recognize your talents, and helping ensure equal education and opportunity for all. And that's listed at the back of the book. The same author also wrote, we are still here which is a, a must have, I think, for libraries. It's written as a student's presentation to their Native com American community. And the book presents 12 concepts that convey what has happened to Native nations after treaty making stopped in 1871. That's a quote from page four. Some of the concepts included are assimilation, termination, relocation, and religious freedom. The continued affirmation following each concept is, we are still here. It includes more information and a timeline at the back of the book. This is well titled. It is a picture book for older readers about a, a despicable attack. It tells of the community of Greenwood of black families on the other side of the railroad tracks from Tulsa. The reader follows a black family moving into town, unpacking their car, and walking through Greenwood where they see thriving businesses, libraries, and schools. In 1921, a young black man was accused of assault on a 17-year-old white female elevator operator. Concerned that he would be lynched before there was a trial, 
30 African Americans hurried to protect him. They met a group of 2,000 white men. Two black men and 10 white men died. The white men, following rumors of a possible attack, turned on the community of Greenwood, burning and looting as they went. Around 300 black people died. Afterwards, many of them left for good while others began to rebuild. There is a, a somewhat positive note at the end because it talks about Tulsa's Reconciliation Park. There is also a graphic novel format nonfiction title on my teens list you'll hear about on January 5. It's titled Across the Tracks. This is a memoir. Yelchin, his parents and grandmother and older brother shared one room of an apartment in Leningrad with other people living in the other rooms. Each night they moved the furniture so they could lay their pallets on the floor to sleep. Yelchin sat, slept under the table and drew on the bottom of the table with the pencil he'd snitched from his father. Nobody knew he was doing that. His memoir shares his confusion about the world around him and also his concern about what he could do with his life. His brother is a talented ice skater, but Yelchin is worried that he can't do anything. His mother worked for the ballet company, so he even tries hard to dance to no avail. When his drawings are finally discovered, his family is relieved. He will study art with a local legend, and it is here he is introduced to many artists through the books that she owned. Humor, unsettling reality, and hope for the future combine to give one person's experience living in the Soviet Union during the Cold War. And there's lots of illustrations on the page. They are his remembered um, sketches from the under the table, is what he says. Now we'll talk about some fiction. I did, I do have a lot of these same titles that I had at conference, but I added some more because we have more time. So I'm just gonna keep talking. There you go. Isaiah, he's 10. His father died suddenly four months ago. Isaiah has always loved words and writing poems like his father, but now he cannot write at all. He has his father's notebook and is slowly reading through it. He doesn't want to finish it. Mostly his dad wrote stories of Isaiah Dunn, superhero. His mother is depressed and has turned to alcohol. Isaiah worries. They already lost their apartment and are now living in a smoky motel room. His four-year-old four sister goes to daycare some of the time. A classmate picks on him but is never caught in the act. His best friend, Sneaky, sells candy bars at school. And Isaiah thinks if he helps him, he could make some money to help his family. There's a lot going on, but when will Isaiah find some help and relief? <clears throat> this is a novel in verse by Joseph Bouchock. Malian is visiting her grandparents on the reservation when the shelter in place announcement comes out due to COVID-19. School via the internet is difficult due to an intermittent Wi-Fi connection, but she enjoys hearing her, her grandparents' tales of life, of traditional stories, and of wrongs done in the past. While there, a large dog apparently adopts Malian and her family, enjoying their company and food, and occasionally protecting them. She has never spent so much time with her grandparents. She learned a lot about their lives, her people, and life on the reservation, even though she continues to miss her parents. This is great fun, a full color graphic novel in medieval times. Perigold and Wolf Wolfric are kittens that have opened a monster hunter's booth, but they don't have any customers. They are new to the business. After they help a lady with what turns out to be a plumbing issue, they now have a beautiful pink jewel. Next thing they know, a monster is stomping through the village and they are the only monster hunters in sight. Silly, clever, funny, with very little blood. The monster isn't bad. She was being blackmailed by someone. And this is marked as book one on the spine, so be prepared for more. Farrah Rock's Fifth Grade is the first book in a series. I think there's three so far. Farrah in fifth grade, is an Arab American and her best friend, Allie, they both hope to be successful with their applications to Magnet Academy for sixth grade and beyond. Both are excellent students, so it should be no trouble. But when a new student starts bullying Farah's younger brother, she comes up with her own plan of how to handle it, which means she will miss out on Magnet Academy. Is this her best choice? Farah's parents are immigrants from an unnamed country and they are Christians. In this book, family is important, and also she needs to learn to ask for help and keep trying. 
Horace, a Boston Terrier, is not fond of dirt or the outdoors, but his person has bought a farm and adopted a potbelly pig named Bunwinkle. So Horace is stuck with them both, dirt and outdoors, well, and Bunwinkle. They all have a lot to learn about the farm and the other animals there. As Horace adapts to the cheerful Bunwinkle and the dirt of the farm, the two of them begin to realize that one by one, animals are disappearing from neighboring farms. What if one of them get taken? They search for clues and try hypothesis after hypothesis without discovering what is going on. Then one day, Bunwinkle is gone. Horace knows their person will be heartbroken and maybe Horace has gotten a little used to having Bunwinkle around, but he must solve this mystery. Wes Henderson is ready for middle school starting sixth grade he wants his style to be spot on. He's very concerned about that. His parents have taken him to many local area protests, which he did not enjoy. But now a developer is offering to buy houses in his community of Kensington Oaks. He slowly becomes involved in fighting the gentrification of his neighborhood. He acknowledges that he and his family are better off than some others, but they are not close to being well off. A school library journal says, Giles has crafted an outstanding depiction of the nuances of gentrification, as well as, as the struggle and joys of working class black families and communities. And this is a real concern in a number of communities. So um, that's something to, to think about for your collection. Well, I had to add a Dan Gutman book, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> Don't we need Dan Gutman? Yes. Harry Mancini is 11 and he lives in the house Harry Houdini lived in for the last years of his life, so he has read quite a bit about the famous escape artist. After Harry and his best friend Zeke do something stupid, Harry is in a coma for a week. When he wakes up, one of the gifts left in his hospital room for him is an old flip cell phone. Now, how, why? Who left this and whatever could he use it for? He doesn't have a cell phone, so he takes it with him. But one night it buzzes and someone is texting with him claiming to be Houdini. Well, this kid, Harry, is not a fool. He knows people pull pranks all the time, but he doesn't even know the number of this phone. How could his friend be doing it? Who is it that's really texting him? And eventually, because the Houdini on the phone and the texting knows about the squeak of the, of the floorboard in his bedroom, he decides this really is Houdini, because who else would know that? That room, that floorboard squeaks. It's got to be him. So they have chats. It takes a while to convince him, but now he's pretty sure it's real. Houdini wants to play, trade places just for one hour. He wants to see what New York is like now in the future. And so they do. They trade places. But what Harry Mancini didn't know was, look at the cover. His hour is hair raising. What? <laughs> He gets put in a straight jacket and pulled up high, but he has been studying Houdini and he manages to get out of the straight jacket based on things that Houdini used to do because he knew his tricks. But he did, he does get returned to his bedroom as promised in an hour and he's back on his bed and he is so relieved because he's afraid of heights and Houdini had told him, you know, you got to face these things and then they won't scare you anymore. Well, I don't know if this worked, but but now Houdini wants to trade places forever. And he claims there is nothing that Harry Mancini can do about it because he knows how to switch him and he's going to do it. Will this really happen? Is Houdini that selfish? Is Harry going to end up in the past forever? Oh, and now if you like scary stories that aren't really scary, this is the book for you. There are 14 stories with more humor than scariness because I am a chicken for reading scary stories and I had a great time reading this. It's fun with skeletons, zombies, mummies, and other monsters. And every page, two page spread has two to four black and white illustrations as you would expect. Anything that's related to a wimpy kid is going to be that way. And it's, it's great fun. It's a good book for any time of the year, but especially around Halloween. <clears throat> this is a full color graphic novel. Cece is 12 and she and her parents have just moved to Seattle from Taiwan. 
She makes a couple of friends in school, but things are still strange to her. She wants her ama, her grandmother, to come and visit, but the plane ticket is too expensive. Then she hears about a cooking contest for kids with a prize of $1,000. That could pay for Amma's ticket. She has to, uh, Amma was teaching her how to cook before they left, but only Taiwanese food. That's all she knows how to cook. She does enter and she's partnered with Miranda who has competed before and is determined to win. Can Cece contribute when she only knows Taiwanese food? This includes Cece's feeling of, of being bullied about her lunch that she brings because it smells funny. Kids keep calling her Chinese and not Taiwanese and other things along the lines. Cece is dedicated and works hard to help her family. She does well in school and she wants to contribute to the cooking contest. I gave this to my great niece who loves to cook with her mom. She thinks it's a great book. Oh, Black Boy Joy. Oh, look at that cover. Oh, it's gonna be good stories. Yay. There are 17 short stories containing everything from science fiction, realistic fiction, graphic novel format, and poetry. The 17 authors are well known, such as Varian Johnson, Jason Reynolds, Jerry Craft, Lamar Giles. There are plenty of joyful plots to choose from for anyone looking for a quick story. And you might want to use this book to just read a short story aloud to your class sometime. Some of them are kind of weird because science fiction, but well, speaking of kind of weird. Here's Bedhead Ted. This is also a full color graphic novel. Ted and his best friend Stacy are starting fourth grade. Both of them are teasing, are teased by bullies. Ted, due to his unruly red hair, and Stacy for being a boy having a girl's name. Now his parents have tried to cut his hair. It won't cut. Not possible. You can't do it. Try, won't work. His hair looks like that all the time. Rumors of the Brookside Beast, an enormous raccoon leaving giant foot, footsteps in people's yards, have some citizens concerned. Stacy believes in it and he is determined to encounter it. Uh, Ted's not so interested, but he goes along with his friends. While sitting in his room with his dog, Stuart, Ted discovers his hair can catch things, pick them up, pet the dog, and more, all by itself. Stacy tells him he has the makings of a superhero, but Ted isn't sure about that. What will happen if they encounter the beast and how will they ever overcome the bullies? So again, this book is about bullying and about working together, saying you're sorry and friendship. And yes, there really is a big giant raccoon, watch out. Shanice is 12 and she is the latest in the line of ball players. Her dad and his dad and his granddad played baseball. Shanice plays on the only all black softball team in the Dixie Youth Softball Association. All the other teams have at the most three black players on their team. But now just as the playoffs are arriving, Shanice learns her great grandpa was likely framed for a crime he didn't commit, stealing a donated Joe DiMaggio baseball glove, glove from a charity auction. Her great uncle Jack has given her the task of clearing his name, but how that happened so long ago? It has softball action and team support, rach, racial prejudice, prejudice in the past and the present, family and mystery. And the about the author section mentions the author's softball playing days too. So she's played softball as well. David is used to avoiding the Romero twins who live next door and rule the school. Imagine his dismay when on the first day of third grade, triplets new to the school are assigned to his classroom and they end up surrounding him. Soon the battle is on for who will rule the school now, the twins or the triplets. Somehow David ends up in the middle and he needs to come up with an idea that will determine the winners without any bloodshed. When he mentions the problem at home, his mom says, maybe you can turn this problem into an opportunity. And he comes up with a good answer. So this is problem solving, making friends with bullies and finding a nonviolent solution. And this book is marked as book one in the Twins versus Triplets series. So there's obviously going to be more. And my last book, can you believe it? We went fast. This is book two in the Ryan Hart story um, series. In this one, Ryan Hart has a lot going on the summer before she starts fifth grade. Her mom is expecting a baby and now has to be on bed rest. For the first time, Ryan and her friends will attend several days at their church's overnight camp. 
Ryan is excited until she learns that Red, Amanda's friend that was mean to her in book one, will be in the same cabin with them. Faith is important to Ryan and her family, and church camp helps Ryan with her feelings about Red, remembering to do the right thing and helping her mother and family, and also preparing for a new sibling are all part of this book. And thank you, and I should have added more books on my list. <laughs> I it was doing too many. No problem. <laughs> have any questions or? Um, it was fantastic because I um, love. Um, so I want you to I, your slide uh, back up there. Instead, you know, put your slide back up instead of your oh, go webinar. Sorry. Leave the thank you slide up. Where'd it go? Okay, here we go. I don't know you close it. Is it still there? Did I quit sharing? No, no, it, it's all right. Okay. Sorry. I always turn things off right away. Anyway, Dana, what were you saying? I'm sorry. Um, I liked this because it kind of gave me a reminder because I didn't, I wasn't able to write all of them down last time. And so this gave me more time to do that. So I really like that. And you make everything sound so good because I would have never picked up the Raleigh Jefferson's awesome, friendly, spooky stories. I would have never done that. Now I'm like, okay, I might give it a try. Well, they're pretty funny and not so scary, but I mean, they do have little ghosts or zombies or something, but. But they're cute. They're cute and silly. Yeah. That's my kind of humor, <laughs> horror and humor. And yes, all of these were my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> so does anybody have any anybody else have any questions or comments want to know anything more about any of the books uh, or if, do you have any um, titles that you want to share with everyone that you you've read um, you know, let us know um, in the uh, question section of your GoToWebinar interface um, I'll also mention while we're waiting to see if anyone does have any that the um, slideshows slide, both these slide presentations will be available with the recording so if you didn't get, as, as Dana was saying, if you didn't get everything noted down, that's okay. <laughs> um, we'll have the slides available for you when that is ready. Um, and then of course you have the present recording to watch too to remind yourself about all the great books that were mentioned today. And I should tell everybody that, uh, give me a couple more days and up on the Nebraska Library Commission webpage, if you search for handouts, it'll take you to a page that's so far, it's all my handouts and nobody else is using it. But I will have a longer, much, much longer list of titles for children, picture books, and um, novels and nonfiction that you can look at um, in case you want to see some other titles that I recommend. Mm -hmm. Because there's just not enough time to include them all in the presentation. So I'll, I'll put that up in a couple of days. Yeah. And that's why I will show you this here, too. Um, this is, as Sally mentioned, her handouts that she's done. Um, over the years too. So if you wanted to see um, some you. previous lists going back until oh geez, 2008 um, are on here. So as you can see every year, um, children's teens, um, summer reading program are all on here. And we did mention that, um, well, Sally mentioned that Dana's presentation was very different. Uh, here's the children's books uh presentation that they did at the NLA conference, correct? <laughs> I don't know if that's just mine or if that has Dana's too. Dana, I should get that from you if you still have it. I do. Um I'll send you both of them and both sets of handouts. Thank you. Perfect. We'll awesome. get it up there. Yes. Um we do have just a comment someone says thank you so many good books. Yes, too many good books. <laughs> I hope you found something for some or another of your nephews and nieces. <laughs> of course, I always do, yeah. Sometimes I give picture books to adults, too. So, Oh, yeah. sure. I think picture books are for all ages. I agree. I bought some for my own use. <laughs> all right, doesn't look like anybody has any um, suggestions of their own. That's fine. I hope, yeah, as, as I said, as Dan and Sally said, we hope you found some great titles for your library collection, uh, for your own personal use, whichever works <laughs> uh, for you. So I think we can actually uh, wrap things up for today if nobody has anything else. Um, 
the presentation will be the presentations will be available. Uh, the recording will be available to everyone. I should have it done and up uh, by the end of the day tomorrow, as long as YouTube um, and GoToWebinar cooperate with me for getting all that processed. Um, this is our main Encompass Live page with our upcoming shows, but at the bottom here is a link to our archives, and this is where the archive will be. The most recent ones are at the top of the list. There'll be a link to the recording and separate links to the presentations on here. So. Um, You'll be able to access that. Everyone who attended today and registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know when it's ready and on here. And we also push out on our various social media. While we're on this page here too, I will show you, we do have a search feature here for our show archives. So if you wanted to check, um, see if we've done something on a particular topic, you can, um, or if we had a particular presenter. You can search the full archives or just the most recent 12 months. If you want something just very current, and that is because this is our full show archives. I'm not going to scroll all the way to the bottom because as you can see, it's a very long list. Um, this is the full show archives going all the way back to when Encompass Live premiered, which was in January 2009. So um, we're talking about 12 years worth of recordings, and they're all here. So it's a long list. Um, but so just pay attention to the original broadcast date of any of these shows if you do watch a recording. Some of the information will be fine, we'll stand the test of time, and you'll you know, be good resources and info, but some things will change. Um, resources and products may change drastically. Um, links uh, sometimes disappear. Huh? Links to, links to other web pages sometimes. Right, links away. may be broken, things mm -hmm. may be different, so um, just pay attention to that. Um, just, uh, we, but we will always, you know, this is what we do as librarians, but one of the things we do is keep things for historical purposes and maintaining them, and we will keep them up here as long as we have a place to host everything. So, um, do, you know, take a look through our archives here. Um, we did have a question. Ah, yes. And the question was answered. Yep, we will have the title list and the presentations will be available when we have the recording posted. Uh, I did mention that Sally is doing her companions show, Teen Titles of 2021, books they will read on January 5th. So the first show of 2022. So do sign up for that if you do need to, um, looking for titles for the older children. And I hope you'll join us next week when we are talking about libraries building pathways to well-being. There it goes. That's cool. um, this is a we, uh, five years ago or so we did uh, we did um, a show um, about this rural libraries and social well-being project, and now this has been this is uh, kind of wrapped up and they've got a final report and. Um, Hope and Eli and Margot will be with us next week to talk about the Rural Libraries and Social Wellbeing Project. So if you are in a rural library or interested in that, definitely the show for you. Sign up for that one. And any of our other shows, we've got our December and January dates filling in here. I even got a February one that I was going to put on today too. So looking forward to what's happening um, later on next year. So that does wrap it up for today. Thank you everyone for being here with us this morning and, and hearing about all the great new children's books. Thank you so much, Dana and Sally. It was great to see you both again. Um, and I'll have to see you back here again next year. <laughs> I um, hope as we with them see those good, great books for 2022. Well, thank you everybody. And we'll see you on a future Encompass Live. Bye-bye. Thanks, Dana. Bye.